that's interesting. Today is January 10th, I believe, 2011. True. That is, and I am talking with Mr. William J. Carter, and we are talking in his home here in Ames, Iowa. And do I have permission to record your voice and your stories? You do. Great. First of all, a very tough question. When were you born and where were you born? Uh, 1925, here in Ames. October 19th, as you think you told me earlier. That's right. That's yeah. right. So, um, you were born in Ames, um, and you're, the Carter family has a long tradition in Ames. Um, they came here in, uh, uh, around not so long before I was born, but they came around 19, uh, 12, 14, long in there. So they moved here from Lake City. Your parents? My grandparents. Your grandparents? My grandparents, Carter, and my maternal grandparents moved here about 1916. What did your grandparents on we'll take your paternal grandparents first. What did your what did your paternal grandparents um, do in Ames? Uh, he was a, my grandfather Carter was a, oh he was a, he sold insurance and real estate and uh, I guess now you probably would have called him a, a land speculator. Uh, was he involved with any particular builders that you know of? He was involved uh, quite a bit with uh, Parley Sheldon, which is an old age name. And, uh, they, they were land speculators together. Do you know any part of town that's developed as a result of your grandfather, Carl? No. Primarily they were involved in farmland all the way from uh, Central Missouri, clear up into Canada. They owned segments of land. Did you remember being at your grandparents in Ames, or do you remember what what were they like? What was it like with your the Carter grandparents? Uh, well, there was they had uh, eight children, uh, and yes, I can remember as a small boy. Uh, visiting there. Uh, the, my grandfather Carter had originally come from northwest Missouri in the Bethany area and he had brothers and his father uh, were from that area and occasionally they would have big get-togethers in Ames. So I met some of his brothers that way. And my Dad's uh, siblings. He had. Uh, he was kind of in the middle. Mm -hmm. He had older brothers and sisters, as mm -hmm. well as younger ones. Yeah. So now, looking at the maternal side, I believe the name was Cure. Cure. Your grandparents Cure. Tell me about what. What did he do in Ames? Uh, he was. Uh, he came to Ames as a. Uh, from Maxwell, he didn't. Come, he'd been night marshal in Maxwell and it worked on the railroad at the same time. Uh, he came to Ames to, as a policeman. And uh, Do you remember roughly what time that would have uh, been? He came in about 1916, seven, probably about 1916. They needed a motorcycle policeman. And he didn't know anything about motorcycles, but he convinced them that he did. And uh, then there were some changes in the police force and, and he wound up being chief of police in 1919. And he had that job then till end of World War II. So um, his first name was, I can't remember. William. William Cure. William. Okay. All right. So let's, let's talk about William a little bit. What was, do you remember as a little boy or as an older person to have, have you heard about what it was like to be a police officer in Ames in 1919? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think. I was, uh, of course, he was, uh, uh, as a little boy, he was uh, probably uh, quite a uh, figure for me, you know, it was a uniform, and, uh, uh, and I spent a lot of time in the, uh, as a little boy in the old 
It's the YSS building now. It used to be the city hall. And the, it was a new building, basically. When I was a small boy, I spent a lot of time there. So you got to be in your grandfather's office. Oh yeah, quite a bit. Uh, and I suppose, uh, well, we didn't live in Ames all the time I was small. We, we probably visited Oh, at least once or once every couple of months, I suppose, through the years. Mm -hmm. Sometimes oftener. So, um, your Grandpa Cure came to Ames and he was the police officer. Do you remember where they lived in Ames? A uh, number of houses. Uh, rental houses, and which most people did in those days, I think. The, old, the house I remember, that, uh, which they moved to probably when I was maybe six or seven, was on Orchard Drive, and that home they bought, and they lived there. They lived there till in the 40s. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about stories about your Grandpa Cure. Was he a good police officer? Well, he had he had reputation of being a good police officer, yes. Uh, and. Uh, and a successful one. And uh, a lot of people liked him. Uh, they had a small, relatively small police force in those days compared to what they have now. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, So if they had a small police force and he was a pretty good police officer, was there much crime in Ames? I can't imagine. Uh, I think probably for the size of Ames, uh, Ames was a town of, uh, oh, when I was small, I, I don't, I suppose uh, less than 10,000 people. Uh, people used to go to Boone to shop. <laughs> That's my, been a My grandmother story. and my aunts, we went to Boone to go <laughs> shopping. Uh, and the uh, student, the student population was, well, I don't think it was probably in the area of four or five thousand students. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think? I mean, Ames was on a, a train route. It was oh, kind there were of a lot the, of hobos. Yeah. <laughs> were there? How did your How did your grandfather handle hobos? Well, he had, he he had, uh, the, he had a he uh, had a a policy if. Uh, the, the city jail was right across from the Shettlemont Hotel. The Shettlemont Hotel had a restaurant called The Grid, which was probably the prominent restaurant in town in those days. And uh, they prepared the meals for the jail. So if there was room in the jail, uh, hobos could be sure they would get a place to sleep. You give them a place to sleep. If depending on when they arrive, they're going to get one meal or maybe two, possibly three, which would be better than they had been getting. And then they got escorted out of town or back down to the station, and they had to catch another freight train out of town. But they had to leave. But they'd catch aim with the next. Of course, that word got around. So there was a pretty steady, steady flow of guys through the jail. But they weren't necessary. They were just vagrants. Mm -hmm. Did any bad criminal element uh, come to Ames? There was some. Uh, yeah, there was some bank robberies. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some. Uh, There were some uh, thwarted bank robberies uh, where he stopped. They, uh, yeah, I, I don't suppose you could do it now, but there was somewhere there was a picture of a there was a car parked in front of a old of a bank on Main Street, and they just it was a foreign foreign appearing car was it? and uh, three men in it. They just stopped the car and. Made the guys unload, and they was they had suitcases full of guns. They were waiting for the bank to open. 
And then there was a college uh, savings. There was a bank at a bank robbery at the college, and uh, I remember. I don't know what year that was, but uh, I remember I was here visiting, and uh, Grandpa got called from the dinner table, and he didn't get back. He did. He didn't get back home for I don't know six weeks or something. Like that. They, oh my chased goodness. Him, they chased him, cleared, they caught him in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Oh my gosh. So your he grandfather was called from the dinner table. They just took off. They just took off. <laughs> and they, they followed them via gas stations and, you know, word of mouth stuff. It took about six, they, they found them. But they got their man. They got, they got, they got. The guy. That's what yeah. the FBI says, but the FBI has nothing on your granddad. <laughs> you know, so a lot of the, oh, there were roadblocks because Des Moines was a popular place and uh, and there was traffic through Iowa on the part of some of the noted gangs of the days, the Dillinger and Carpus and that group. But, uh, so they were always setting up roadblocks. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, prohibition mm -hmm. years, you know. You're saying your grandfather was res was responsible sometimes for setting up the roadblocks, oh, yeah. and was his and job. there were uh, prohibition. And a lot, a lot of uh, there was a lot of criminal activity during the prohibition days. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back to your story for just a second of the car parked on Main Street waiting for the bank to open, and that kind of tells me that there must have sort of been eyes on the street. There. Oh, they had them. I think the uh, they had uh, the the foot patrolman check store check doors on Main Street mm -hmm. all, all a couple times a night, and uh, there was always a there was always a one or two patrolmen on Main Street mm -hmm. downtown. Main and uh, that also tells me that they were pretty observant because they recognized that there was a car that. Just didn't car, yeah. look like it belonged there. Yeah. yeah. So that was that was a thwarted bank That's robbery right, yeah. <laughs> on Main Street. And then there was the one in Campus Town, uh, when when your granddad took off and mm -hmm. had chased to, him and caught him in Idaho. Caught him in Idaho. Yeah. <laughs> um, was the one in Campus Town by chance maybe in the nineteen thirties? That was kind of do you think yeah, I'm not, I don't want to pin you down to a date, but we can always check what it out. What was the question? Um, the bank robbery in Campus Town. Was Would it have been in the 30s? Yes. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Late, late 30s. Okay. Late, mid to late okay. 30s. All right. Um, so I want to return also to the when you were a kid and you were playing in your grandfather's office um, in the old city hall, now the YSS building. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about features of the the building? Was well, it the building was... Uh, well, some of this stuff I picked up after I was grown and retired well, sure. and moved back to age, but the, the, uh, and some of it I remember as a small boy, the, the uh, fire station was in the same building, the, um, and the uh, fire department had, uh, when they built the building, they were in, the, they didn't, they weren't mechanized at that time. And there was a, there was a stable under. Hard to believe this, but there was a place to keep horses in the building, and there was a place to store hay in the building, and big grain bins down under what is now the alley. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've I've been down in there, but it's been a long time. I'm sure now with the, it's all been filled in, and, mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you had mentioned putting up roadblocks. Was your grandfather Cure ever involved in slowing down any there big was criminal? A, when or? I was probably, oh, about junior high age, they said there was someone had escaped from prison yeah, I presume Fort Madison, and anyway, through Des Moines, and they set up a roadblock south of Ames, and uh, 
on 69, and the, the guy, uh, my grandfather took the middle of the road, to, and the guy ran over him. Uh, so he was badly injured, uh, and was in the hospital for quite a while from that, I mean. Wow. With a skull fracture and broken ribs and broken oh leg. And I remember that. I remember coming to see him. And the, the, they, they, caught the, uh, they caught the man and it took a day or so, but they did. Mm -hmm. They caught him. Wow. Uh, um, I'm just wondering if, you know, you had mentioned it was prohibition time and there was a lot of gang activity. Oh, I mean, the name Dillinger comes to mind. Did he, if your grandfather have any brushes with any of those? No, they names? had set up roadblocks a time or two because I think it was a, there was a bank robbery in Mason City was attributed, I think, to John Dillinger. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a Dillinger hideout in Wisconsin or Minnesota mm -hmm. or both places. And they used to use 69 uh, heading north. But a lot of Prohibition Act, a lot of uh, bootlegging. Boot, Highway 30 was a big route for uh, bootleggers from mm -hmm. from Carroll County to Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, Templeton Ryan. It wasn't all Templeton Ryan. It was just, most farmers in Carroll County had a had a mash barrel in the hog house. Mm -hmm. Well, we've mentioned that, um, you know, freight trains came through um, Ames, and um, you had uh, told me once about, you know, somewhere on Main Street, you can actually see how freight trains were were sided off and there were steel plate oh, openings. Oh, there, there were tracks down Main center of Main Street. Uh, and you can remember this as a little boy, so yeah. we're talking about late 1920s. And, and many of the stores, well, since they redid Main Street seven or eight years ago, it's all gone now. But prior, prior to that time, there were a few places in front of buildings on Main Street where you'd find they had, uh, they had glass blocks set in the concrete uh, in the sidewalk. Some of them had... Uh, big steel doors which you walked over and those were all uh, either to provide light or an entry to the basement and they used to unload freight cars mm -hmm. uh, in into those places in the mm -hmm. middle of, at, at night they would, they would run a switch engine and bring freight so cars. maybe if I went in the basement of some of the buildings you in Main Street I might see where that chute went up to the the main level. They're, they're probably all boarded up, but or Most of them are, concrete. But, but uh, well, they are now because when they redid Main Street to put in new infrastructure, and so but a lot of the old basements had a they had the basement, but then they had a part that was kind of a shelf went out under the sidewalk, mm -hmm. and that they would unload the trains into. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's kind of off the subject, but we were talking about trains, and I remember you had told me a little bit about that. But back to um, your grandfather, William Cure, um, was he ever involved in the arrest or of of some uh, big big criminals? Um, Bonnie and Clyde come to mind. Was he ever? Involved? No, I no. think he was involved in the, in the posse that. Uh, I don't know who was that. Was it uh, that? Uh, who were the ones that were shot down by? Was it Adair or Stewart? I, Dexter, maybe. Um, Bonnie and Clyde. I was thinking. I don't know. Maybe. That, maybe I don't know. Was it, I yeah. thought your grandfather might have been in a posse for he one of those things. He was involved in that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, was your um, grandfather cure a person who went to high school? Did he get... No, I think he went to probably the equivalent of uh, third or fourth grade, probably. My goodness. Well, you've shown me pictures so of his... Was born in a, he was born in a... He was born in Mount Pleasant, and mm -hmm. uh, his father was then was a Civil War veteran, and he went to Kansas, homesteaded in Kansas. Mm -hmm. And they lived in a sod house, 
My grandfather's mother died, I think, when he was around 10 or 11. And by the time he was 12, he went to work on the railroad with his dad. Mm. And he worked on this section. But you have shown me his writing, and he's very literate, so how yeah, did taught, he... He taught himself. Wow. So, yeah. Well, third grade. And he was the police chief from, like, 1919 to... Mm -hmm. The interesting Robert thing about it was that in those days, the police chief was a, was an appointed position in Ames. And generally, when you got a new mayor, you got a new police chief. That's the way it worked. So he he survived a lot of mayors. We must have done a good job. He had job. a lot of friends. Oh, uh -huh. He had a lot of friends, yeah. and uh, he had, and particularly he had a lot of friends at the university, mm -hmm. and that was a factor in those days. Mm -hmm. the, uh, so when you were at the university, now then as a young man, did you live with your grandparents? I here? did. Yes. So I you did. got to really know your grandfather as an adult, as well as mm -hmm. when you were a, you were did, a kid. Yeah. Do you remember any, can you tell me when you went to Iowa State? I'm sorry, I don't know. I got, I started in 43 and then mm -hmm. I went in service and I came back in uh, January 46. Okay. And I got out in 49. Okay. So by the time, really your grandfather was beginning to retire by the time well, you he Well, he retired, him. he retired the spring I got out of the, uh, the spring before I got out of the service, mm -hmm. he retired. Yeah. Uh, the spring of 45. Uh -huh. Was it tough for your grandfather being retired? He seems like oh, such I a... Think so, yeah. He was such an active man. He was, yeah, he was. Did he tell you stories? How did you learn about your grandfather? He told me stories. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you have to take it with a grain of salt, or do you feel he's pretty oh. accurate? No, I believed it all. Uh, when, uh, even when I was a real little boy, I was his, uh, probably I was the first grandson. And uh, we used to come and visit, and, uh, and when they, they'd go to bed at night, we'd go to bed at night, why? Uh, a lot of times I'd go to bed sleep in his bed. He'd tell me stories. I'd go to sleep. But uh, he could tell you stories about uh, living in a sod house and mm -hmm. Indians coming to the door mm -hmm. when he was a little boy. Mm -hmm. I'd like to move from your grandfather to your father. And your father has um, some distinguishing characteristics too because uh, he went to Iowa State University. And when did your grandfather, uh, or is your father, um, go to Iowa State? He he graduated in uh, 1924 mm -hmm. and uh, played football. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a reserve guard. He shouldn't have been, but he was. He played. Uh, he played when Jack Trice was. Mm -hmm. Oh, they were the same team. Yeah. So, um, your grandfather's name that we're talking about now is the one to Iowa State. I mean, so your father. No, I'm sorry. My, Sam. Sam Carter. Yeah. So now we're, we're kind of switching sides yeah. of the family. Yeah. So your father was Sam Carter, and you said he played a reserve guard. Yeah, at Iowa State. At and Iowa he State. Played, uh, he played high school. Ames High had uh, my mother and father both went to Ames High School. And in 1919, Ames was recognized as the state champion football team. And Dad played on that team. They had, uh, they didn't have the rules in those days, but in the, the football team of Ames High in 1919, had the, the nucleus of that team had been in the Army, been to France, came back to Ames High to finish school, and they went out. They played football, and uh, yeah, and and they just they beat every the 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 uh, the old newspapers at the library carry accounts they of that team, and uh, those were tough kids. 
I they, mean, they, someone came. They came right from the trenches. That's my came point. Back home, played football, <laughs> age high school. Yeah, they were tough kids. And I don't mean that in a pejorative no, sense. No, but they were. They, they, was a they were experienced. Like and sixteen-year-olds versus uh, eighteen, twenty, twenty-one-year-old men. Mm -hmm. And they had come back to get their high school get diploma, their high school, yeah. right after having served yeah. in the armed sur services. So your father, Sam Carter, mm -hmm. played on that 1919 yeah. team mm -hmm. that won the yeah, state championship. Yeah, somewhere in the family. I think my oldest son has a, there's a, has a little gold football that says uh, Ames I 1919 state champion. And did you, how did you learn about this? Did you learn about this? Obviously you said when you were older well, and you yeah. read newspapers, but well, did your father tell you about it? from my dad and from my dad's friends. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so your father, grad, Sam Carter, graduated from Ames High, and then he went to Iowa State University. And do you know anything about how he got on the football team? Uh, well, there, there weren't scholarships. You just, you went out for football. Uh, but, and, and he, he lettered uh, back when they gave uh, they didn't give an I, they gave a big A. Uh, he, he had a big letter sweater. And World War II came along, my mother uh, took it all apart and did it, uh, scarves and mittens for the soldiers. But uh, the. Uh, did you ever get to save the A? Did you ever get to see it? Yeah, I used to wear it when I was in high school. I'd wear it in the wintertime. You didn't need a coat. It was a real heavy wool, heavy thing you ever saw. But I can understand the patriotic sense mm -hmm. of reducing the sweater to yarn. Mm -hmm. And did, uh, did, the, did anybody ever save the A, though? Yeah, it was around my parents' house for a long time, but... Uh, it's it's well, gone yeah. the way things One go. Yeah. So, uh, if your father, Sam Carter, was playing on the Iowa State team, did he have any comments about Mr. Trice? Do you know? Yeah, he knew him. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, no, other, and uh, I had heard the story from, my father didn't make the trip to Minneapolis. He was, most of the time when he was on the Iowa State team, he was on the injured list most of my grandmother used to say, she'd go to the games and she'd say, uh, here comes Sam, and then in a minute she'd say, there goes Sam. He was always getting hurt, uh, shoulder and knees mm -hmm. and so forth. But anyway, he was too small. Mm -hmm. Did he ever remark about the fact that what we would say now is a, a black citizen or an African American citizen was on the team? Do you, do you ever recall him mentioning that? Yeah, we, he talked about it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the consensus is, I grew up with the consensus that it was, uh, it was a bad, it was a bad thing that happened, that it was more or less deliberate and the care that he received following the injury mm -hmm. was not adequate, was not adequate, poor. Mm -hmm. you know. I just wondered if your father had ever mentioned, did he, did they ever have any time to have a conversation with Jack Trice? Did he well, ever I talk about? I think so, but I can't, you, I don't, you don't know. Yeah. That, no. well, I don't, I don't know what young men did that was, you know, a collegial sort of thing to do during, during that time period. Well, my dad worked, because uh, he was, his, my, my grandfather Carter had lost a great deal of money in the, there was a depression, a big drop in land prices in around 1921, and so my my dad had to work to go to school. And he had jobs, uh, he did construction work in the summers. Uh, he did, he worked for, uh, and I've forgotten the man's name, a man that did catering in the, during school year, they catered parties and fraternities, mm -hmm. and my father learned how to cook. And then and he played football besides. So, mm -hmm. uh, he was, he was a very active person. But as conversations, yeah, I'm sure there were. Uh, 
And when they made, when they dedicated the statue of, this is after I retired and we moved back to Ames, they dedicated the statue of Jack Trice, which they had originally over by Beardshire. And there were a few people. I went to that dedication, and there were a handful of men there who had been on the team mm -hmm. and remembered my father. But, uh, and, uh, you know, that's about as far as it went. <laughs> well, certainly, you. Um your family life is really entwined with the history of Ames, Mr. Carter. You, you have. Uh, I know you didn't live your whole life no. here, but you certainly. Here often. Uh, but you were here often, and you've got deep, deep historical roots. Is there anything you'd like to tell me about your father, your grandfather, that I haven't asked that you'd like to talk about? Well, no, except that they were. They both, both grandparents, both grandfathers. They moved to Ames. The reason they came here was to educate the kids, which was a common thing in those days. Uh, I guess it, uh, you just you moved to where the college was. <laughs> I think um, that's been a theme mm -hmm. for Ames for a long time. Yeah, that so. education has really been a driving force. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you for your time. I really You're enjoyed welcome. this conversation. And I hope uh, you'd let me come back if I have some other hey, questions. You sure we can. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you so much.